Hello. Hi, everyone. I am here. We are here. Well, we aren't here yet, but I am here. Yes, I am. Yes, I. It is February some date. What's today, guys? February 19th. Yes. And I am here on today, February 19th. Praise God, from whom our blessings flow. Praise him, all people here below. Yeah, that's an old one. Hi, Tanya. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I was trying to remember the third line of this song, and I can't right now. It's like, praise God. From whom our blessings flow, praise him, all people here below, praise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Can't remember that third line, Tanya. Get no, girl, get no. I haven't sung that song in so long. All right, we're going to give it about 30 more seconds, and then we will get started. I'm sure your daddy knows that song. Your mama knows it too, Tanya. My mama knows it too. I'll have that third line pretty soon. Yes, yes, yes. But we're going to get started. We are... Oh, I had to get that yawn out, guys. I'm sleepy. It's only 1026, but I'm sleepy today. But we are going to finish this. All right. So we are uh, in Matthew 14 today. As you know, we are going through the New Testament in a year. We are going slow. It's wonderful. We started in February. Uh, earlier this month, and we are now on the 14th chapter, moving at a pace that I hope is feels comfortable to everyone, and everyone feels like they can uh, stay on point with us and even use the weekends to catch up, hopefully, if you ever get behind. So it's a little bit easier than what we did last year because we had to take on sometimes three or four chapters in a day, um, which was harder um, because if you fell behind and you have to like read 15 or 20 chapters over the weekend, so that made things a little harder. Um, this is a little easier as long as you somewhat keep up. If you fall behind, there is the possibility of reading all the chapters that you are behind in one weekend and catching up in that weekend. So this should feel a little bit more comfortable. I really wanted to take it very slow. Um, and I want to make sure we have ample time in the end to deal with revelations, um, the revelation, I should say. Um, and so we are slowing it down, everyone. But we are in Matthew 14, and um, we just came off of chapter 13, which was like the parables. Um, and now we are in 14, and it opens up with King Herod. Um, being guilty about killing John the Baptist. Now, this is like news to us, right? Because it's like, wait, whoa, what happened to John the Baptist, right? Uh, so it's almost like here it just, uh, I'm sorry, like Matthew just starts writing and then it's like, oh, wait, y'all don't know. Let me tell you what happened, right? You ever had somebody tell you a story and they start from the end, assuming that you know the beginning and you like all confused, like, what? And then they're like, oh, wait, let me tell you the story. Well, that's kind of how this is written, right? Because he tells us um, that Herod was feeling so guilty about the death of John the Baptist that when he heard about all the great things that Jesus was doing, he actually, in his uh, mind, was like, oh, maybe that's John the Baptist reincarnated, right? Uh, which, of course, didn't make sense because John the Baptist and Jesus like were on the scene at the same time. Uh, but remember, Herod, you know, his mind wasn't always, you know, wasn't always there, right? Uh, he just was so consumed with guilt. Uh, I am sure that that thought made sense to him at the time that he said it. But then Matthew goes on and he tells us what happened. And so um, if you read the story of Matthew and then uh, some of the other gospels in even history, 
tells us that uh, King Herod um, sort of like put his wife away, like divorced her or sent her back home to her people because he fell in love with his, well, we don't even know if it was love. We'll say he fell in lust. He fell in lust with his brother's wife. So basically he sent the wife he had, which was from another uh, country, he sent her on her little merry way. Like, I don't want you no more. I'm already, I'm going to marry my sister-in-law, my brother's wife. I, I'm digging on her. And because I'm the king, I pretty much can do whatever I want to. So not feeling you no more. And we're going to bring my brother's wife. Well, I don't know what my brother going to do. He can figure that out. Go get you another wife because I'm taking yours, right? And so that's basically what happened. And John the Baptist was like, that's not right. And um, the theologians that I read um, were saying how the tense um, that is used when it says that John the Baptist said this was like a prevailing tense, like a tense that um, implied that he said this more than once. So it wasn't like uh, John the Baptist checked him one time about stealing his brother's wife, but it was like a campaign. Like every time he saw him, it was like, you know you're wrong, right, for stealing your brother's wife, right? Um, and he would send messages probably. You know you're wrong, right, for, for stealing your brother's wife. You know that's not right. You know that's against everything, right? You can't just be stealing your brother's wife. And so um, the brother's wife, who obviously wanted to be stolen, so it wasn't like she was stolen and... Um, uh, was upset about it, right? But she has some aspirations of her own. Um, and when you kind of look at the trickery with which she used to get uh, John the Baptist killed, it kind of made me think like, what trickery did she use to get in the king's good graces so that he would take her and make her his instead of her husband, right? Like then it just makes you go further and further back into thinking about like uh, uh, conspiracy theory, theories, right? Did she marry her brother just so that she, uh, the king's brother, just so she could somehow get at the king? We don't know all of the backstory plot, right? All of that could be true. None of it could be true. We don't know. But what we do know is that she was very happy to be over there with Herod um, and very annoyed with John the Baptist that he kept bringing up that this wasn't right, this this scandalous thing they had done, right? And so uh, they were having a birthday party um, for Herod and uh, Herodias, who is the wife of the brother that was stolen, right? Herodias's daughter came to dance for Herod. And um, uh, this wasn't like a little girl, like we're not talking like eight or nine or anything like this. It was probably a teenager, someone in their culture who was up in age, who could uh, uh, be married even, right? Um, and the prevailing thought is that she was lewdly dancing um, in a way that created lustful thoughts, right? Uh, in Herod's mind to the point where he was like, ask whatever you want. You can have whatever you want, right? And so um, according to uh, the Bible, she asked for what her mother wanted, right? Her mother wanted John the Baptist's head on a platter. And so the daughter was like, why he said I can have anything I want. What should I ask for, right? Ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter. And um, the Bible says when Herod heard it, he was very sad because the only reason why he had killed John up to this point was because he was scared of what the people might do because people loved John, right? Um, and so he didn't want to do it, but he made an oath to that girl while she was dancing that he would give her whatever she asked for. Again, that could have been another setup, right? He could have had, uh, Herodias could have had her daughter dance ex ex uh, expressly for that purpose. We don't know, right? But she wanted John the Baptist's head on the platter. And when I say they did it immediately, they went to the prison chopped off John's head, so whoever had to, whatever guard had to do that, right? Chopped off John's head, put it on a platter and brought it up in the middle of the party still going on. Uh, just horrendous, right? Can you imagine? 
can you imagine you just sitting at a party having fun and then all of a sudden they come up with a head on a platter? That just shouldn't be normal, right? Um, but Herodias was happy. You know, this this pleased her um, that his head was on a platter. Uh, but the king was distressed. He knew he was wrong. Um, he knew he was wrong, which brings us back to the beginning when he was like, maybe that's Jesus. Maybe John is, is being reincarnated and that's him in Jesus, right? I mean, he just, I'm sure he was not right. History tells us that, um, uh, remember, he had a wife and he put away his wife. So like sent her back home. So like history tells us that when he sent her back home, like the father came after him and was uh, created some kind of war. Um, and so he had to deal with that problem. But then um, his own brother, who we'll hear about in um, uh, future chapters and future gospels, Helene uh, Agrippa. Um, and I, there was one video I was doing a while ago and I couldn't think of uh, the king's name, uh, who was almost convinced to come to Christ. Hey, Juan. Um, and it was, um, uh, King Agrippa. So Agrippa was the brother, right? And the brother accused King Herod of um, of treason um, and got him thrown out uh, of being king and banished him and Herodias to an island. And so King Herod and Herodias, who never rose to the title of queen, because you know he can he didn't marry her. He just took her in and said, "Hey, she here with us now." Um, um, uh, they both were banished to an island and history says that they both committed suicide on that island, right? Which probably was another plan of Herodias. If you think about it, he was doing everything Herodias said. Um, probably she only wanted to be uh, queen and have all of these riches and have all of this power. And now they're banished to an island. Um, and now she like, no, this ain't what I signed up for. Let's just, you know, drink this, right? And next thing you know, they were out of here. Um, so that's the story of how John the Baptist uh, was killed. He was martyred. Uh, martyr means when you kill for the because of the faith, right? Uh, so he was a martyr because he was killed because he prophesied the right thing and to do the right thing. Um, and um, uh, they killed him. For doing the right thing, right? All right, moving on along to, to something a little less gruesome than heads on a platter. Um, we come to this, and um, it says in verse 13 when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary uh, solitary place. So Jesus heard what happened to John the Baptist. Um, Oh, you didn't hear that. Okay, so I'll repeat it real briefly, Lene. They asked for John's head on a platter uh, because she was mad at John because John had been prophesying over and over again every chance he got that, hey, you know it's wrong. You you wasn't supposed to be taken from your husband. You're supposed to be over there with your husband. He wasn't supposed to take you. You're not supposed to be here. You ain't got no place. You ain't the queen. You ain't the queen. You ain't the queen. You know, however John the Baptist did it. But he was constantly putting their sin in front of their face. And because he was constantly putting their sin, she wanted revenge. So that he was in prison already because of this. But she wanted revenge. Prison wasn't enough for her. She was nothing, you know, what do they say? Nothing uh, is worse than a woman scorned, right? She was scorned. It was like, we need to deal with this because he think he's somebody. Who he is going to talk to you like that and you the king, uh, something like that. So she just wanted proof that he was dead um, and to show that the king had all this superior power that he could kill John the Baptist, which was he was highly respected by the people. Um, so when Jesus heard about this, um, in verse 13, it says Jesus went on a boat and sort of kind of just went to be by himself, you know, to mourn John. Um, because, you know, um, he knew who John the Baptist was. Hey, Ty. Um, and so he was trying to go and be by himself and mourn his friend, which is what he, what he was trying to do. Um, but because um, the multitudes were following Jesus everywhere he went. It says in verse 14, well, the rest of verse 13, it says the crowds followed him on foot. So like they found him and started following him. 
Um, and then Jesus, uh, to me, this is this was uh, shows the heart of Jesus, right? It says, verse fourteen, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now he went away to be alone and to pray and to you know kind of deal with the death of John the Baptist. And he wasn't really running necessarily from being afraid of Herod, right? That wasn't really it. It was just like, you know what? It's not my time yet. Uh, I know what my fate is, but this is not my time and Herod is not the one to do it. So, you know, let me get out of Dodge and go over here and just deal with the fact that, you know, cause I mean, he remember um, uh, Jesus was a person. He wasn't walking around as a spirit with a light bubble on his head. So it bothered him just like it would bother us if, if one of our dear friends um, um, was murdered, right? By the king, right? Um, it would bother us. And so he's going away to deal with himself and the crowds are following. But when the crowds are following, he didn't do like what I think some of us would have done, right? When the cloud, when the crowds follow and we trying to go mourn and pray and get ourselves together, what y'all doing? Look, I ain't got time. This is not the time. This is not the place. We can heal you later. Come back tomorrow. Come back next week. Uh, we can talk about this healing at another time. But Jesus didn't do that, right? Um, and it made me think about how um, when we're going through, when we're going through uh, situations, whether it's grief or or frustration or persecution or or we're angry about something, our whole life stopped, right? Everything got to stop. Okay, nothing get done and definitely ain't nothing spiritual getting done, right? Because we just got to, you know, take some time and be in ourselves, right? It's like, I got to deal with my emotions, right? Uh, but here Jesus is, uh, uh, you know, having, you know, a good friend be murdered, um, but yet it's still, he still was able to have compassion on the people that came, right? They didn't murder him, right? They didn't murder him. So he had compassion on these people. And so he started healing their sick and laying hands and, and you know, uh, doing what he, the ministry that he had already been doing, deliverance ministry, right? Um, and all of that. And it started getting late. And so his disciples was like, uh, Jesus, it's a whole bunch of people out here and it's getting late. Uh, we need to go ahead and send them home uh, so they can go get something to eat, right? So to me, it sounded like the disciples like, we tired, <laughs> right? We tired and, and we need to get rid of these people, right? Um, and Jesus basically um, looked at them and said, they don't need to go away. Give them something to eat, right? They don't need, they don't need to go away, right? Give them something to eat. Like everything they need is here. They don't need to go away to get anything that they need. Their needs can be met here, right? And so he's pulling on the faith of the disciples, right? And this, this story actually is found in all four gospels. Um, and I, I think it's important with like all four gospel writers thought it important enough to write about this miracle. Um, because Jesus is telling the disciples like, hey, we can handle this right here. And so he's about to perform a great miracle, but first he had to raise the faith of the disciples. And um, the way he does that, in my opinion, is by putting them to work, right? He makes them a very active participant in this miracle and he didn't need to i mean he's jesus he's done great huge wonderful things up to this point so surely he could have called uh you know fish to float from the sea or manna to fall from the sky or some other great miracle that did not require the use of these five loaves of bread and two fish and the use of the disciples to get the people of god or the, the multitudes, I should say, in an orderly fashion. Um, it is told way in more detail, um, I believe in the book of John, where it talks about how they had to order them um, in particular groups, but he didn't have to use the disciples that way. But I believe that it was all about building their faith. Um, so Jesus said, okay, so you only have five loaves of bread, you only have two fish, 
bring him to me, right? And so they brought him the bread. They brought him um, the fish. He looks up to heaven. He blesses it, right? He prays over it. Um, and then he gives them detailed instructions um, of what to do and how to pass out the bread and the fish. And I, I mean, can you imagine the excitement in the air, right? Um, first of all, the people probably weren't even expecting to eat uh, because this, this is the first time. Um, hey, Cliff, this is the first time that that Jesus had ever fed the multitude that we know of, right? Um, it was not ever said before that he fed them or felt a burden to feed them before. Uh, so the people may have not even been in expectation of this, uh, but now he had them sit down, right? Because remember, I told you in the last video, uh, teaching practices then was that the preacher sat and the people stood, right? Um, that would be amazing, right? The people, the, the preacher sat, the teacher sat, and the people stood. So after Jesus stopped teaching, he actually had to have them sit down in groups in order to eat, which uh, means this wasn't just going to be a simple meal. This wasn't just, um, okay, you know, give them, hand them all a piece of fish and send them on their way. But Jesus wanted them to have like a banquet style meal, right? We're going to sit down. We're going to all eat together, right? It was it was supposed to be a big ordeal. And it was. And it was so much food that the Bible says that they all ate, verse 20, and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. So not only uh, from these five loaves and two fish, um, did they eat, but they eat, they ate, they got full and there was food left, right? That's, that's amazing miracle, right? An amazing miracle. They ate, they got full. In other words, they ate uh, until they were full and there was food left. Now this is called, um, the parable, not the parable, but the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000, right? But in those days, they counted the men. They didn't count the women. They didn't count the children. So although there were 5,000 men there, there were also women and children there. And so this number could be 15,000 or 20,000 or even higher. <laughs> excuse me, or even higher, the number who are actually fed on that day. This was an amazing miracle, right? And we're going to talk about it in more detail as we encounter it uh, in other gospels. But um, this was our first encounter of this amazing miracle. Then from there, if you go on to verse 22, it says, um, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd, right? And so this may sound really familiar because, of course, Bishop just, just preached this last Sunday. Excuse me. He just preached this last Sunday, right, about Peter in this boat, right? And so, but the scenario in the backdrop you may not have known um, was that this was immediately following uh, the death of John the Baptist, Jesus finding out about the death of John the Baptist and this feeding of the 5,000. And so remember, Jesus' original intent was to get away alone. And then when he took the boat over to, to be somewhere by himself, as soon as he got off the boat, he was like, oh man, y'all follow me? Y'all walked, right? Um, and, and there was a crowd to meet him there. Um, so now he's uh, dismissing the crowd, like, okay, I've healed, I've done miracles, I've, uh, you know, I've laid hands, uh, I've cast out demons, I fed you. Okay, now y'all, y'all can go, 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 go. And so he puts the disciples in the boat and says, go on over to the other side um, um, uh, as I uh, handle these people. And so he puts the disciples in the boat. They start going to the other side in the boat and he starts dismissing the people. And then he pulls away to himself. Verse 23 says, after he had dismissed them, them being the crowds, the multitudes, 
he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray, right? So after all of that, Jesus was like, I really need to talk to you now, God, right? And so he went on the side of a mountain by himself to pray. So the, the, the multitudes are going away. They're dispersing. I'm sure they're all chattering like, did you see that? Did you, you see how much fish we made? Oh, my God. He, he just made that fish, and the fish was good, too. That was the best fish I ever had, right? Uh, and, and, you know, all of the multitudes are going away, talking about the miracles and the fish and everything. And then the disciples are on the boat. And at first, I'm sure the disciples started talking about the miracles too. Man, first I was kind of worried because he was like, we about to feed all these. They don't have to go away. What you mean they don't have to go away? Uh, but whew, Jesus, he really is. He And then all of a sudden the storm starts, right? And it's like, Jesus, he really is. And wind and rain and the storm starts. So the disciples are uh, going to the other side, but they end up in the middle of a storm. The Bible says there were winds and the waves were buffeting them, right? So the waves were just coming and knocking them aside uh, back and forth, right? Um, and the Bible says here that they were considerable distance from land. So it wasn't like, turn around, we just, we got to tell Jesus that we're not going to get there, right? But they were like probably in the middle of the sea when this was happening. Jesus, however, is on the side of the mountain. He talking to God. He's like, okay, God, give me my strength. I think this is very, very, very important because Jesus didn't say, uh, well, okay, now we'll just go to the other side um, and, you know, I'll find some other time to pray. No, Jesus was like, I came here to pray and I'm not leaving here until I pray. We I came here to pray and I'm not leaving here until I pray. Some of y'all need to get that way about your prayer room, your prayer closet, your prayer space, wherever you pray. Because sometimes you kneel down to pray and all other things start happening. And you need to, even if you got to get up and deal with those things, you better be like Jesus and say, but I came here to pray and I'm not leaving here until I pray, right? And you go right back down there to your prayer room, right back to your prayer closets, right back to your prayer space and say, I'm, I'm here, I'm going to pray, right? This time that Jesus spent alone with the Father was his recharging time. I mean, and, and over and over again, you will see that Jesus made time to uh, pray uh, to the Father. And so if Jesus had to make time to pray, Surely we understand that we need to be making time in our daily lives to pray to the Father, all right? And so uh, he's praying. Now the storm has come. They're in the middle of the sea. And now, you know, they're kind of trying to deal with the storm. It's about four fishermen in the boat, at least four fishermen in the boat. Because remember, the first four people that Jesus called, he called off of fishing boats, right? So it's at least four fishermen in the boat and then and uh, maybe more. And they're trying to deal uh, with the winds and the waves and all of that. Um, in the meantime, Jesus comes down from prayer and it's like, oh, wow, uh, you know, I, that lasted longer than I thought. They're already in the middle of the sea. Well, I'm just going to walk on over there. Right. Um, and verse it, uh, let's see, verse 25 says, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. And so they saw him, right, uh, walking on the lake. And, and uh, Juan likes my sound effects, right? So remember, there was wind and waves. And all kinds of things happening on this boat, right? Um, and in the meantime, while they're trying to deal with the wind, the waves, the rain, the lightning, the thunder, all of these things happening at once, somebody says, what is that, right? Because they see a figure walking towards them 
not in a boat, right? Walking towards them, like just on the water. And they're like, what is that? So now they're terrified. They're screaming. So now you got the winds psh, psh, and the waves psh, psh, and the screams, ah! right? Of men, just because they don't know what's coming toward them. Um, they think it's a ghost, right? So they're they're just really, really, really freaked out because they think it's a ghost. Um, but listen, Jesus said immediately to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And so now, you know, the wind, the waves, the lightning, the thunder, and the screaming. But Jesus is like, look, I ain't, I ain't come to scare y'all. Wait, wait, wait. I am not trying to scare y'all, right? I just want, you know, to, to come. I, I told you I was going to meet you on the other side. Um, I heard one preacher preach this years ago um, that stood with me, right? Uh, because in one version of this, this is, is in all four Gospels, remember, this is too. But in one version of this, it says he would have passed them by, but they were screaming, right? So Jesus was like, well, I was going to the other side, but since y'all making so much noise, I guess I got to deal with this, right? Uh, but he really, like, I told you that I was going to meet you on the other side. I never told you how right? You just assumed that I was going to either be in this boat with you or that I was somehow going to get another boat, but that's not what I said. What I told you was that I was going to meet you on the other side. And sometimes that's what happens in our life, right? We are afraid and terrified of how Jesus has decided to do a miracle in our life. Ooh -wee. Y'all didn't see that one coming, right? But that's what happens, right? Because we thought that Jesus was going to do the simple thing. We thought that Jesus was going to do it the way we had it planned out. Like, Jesus, okay, I need $100. So when I call my Aunt Tuki, just put it in our heart to say yes so that I can get that $100, right? And we don't, we have already designed the plan and we take it to God and try to put our stamp, have God put his stamp on it so that we can get it the way we saw it. But every now and then, Jesus is like, uh-uh, no, that's not how I see it. That's not, that's not how it's going. And it terrifies you the way that Jesus has designed for this miracle to come through because it's something you weren't expecting. You in the middle of the storm and right now it don't even make sense to you. You in the middle of the storm and you want me to do what? You in the middle of the storm and it's like, Jesus, is that even you? You know, I can't even tell. Is that God or is that not God? Is God telling me to do this or is this not God telling? Right? You can't even recognize because you're in the middle of the storm, right? You just watched him do so many miraculous things, but because you're in the middle of the storm, this thing you can't even imagine in your mind, right? But Jesus said, you know what? Don't fear. It's I. I'm there for you. Don't fear. Uh, and so Jesus is there walking on the walking on the sea, walking, walking, walking. They think it's a spirit, right, Tanya? But he's walking, 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 right? If he was a spirit, he probably would have been more like floating, right? But he walking, walking, they're screaming. And then Peter finally says, Well, Lord, if it's you, then bid me to come too, right? Um, and one of the uh translations I was reading basically said it it was like Peter wasn't really challenging God like if it's you because remember Jesus already said it is I right um and so he wasn't really saying is it if it's you he was basically saying it like well since it's you then tell me to come on out there with you right and so Jesus simply says come Jesus knew who he was. This wasn't about testing Jesus. Jesus is like, this is about you. You want to come? Come on, right? You got the faith? Bring it on, right? And that's how Jesus is in a lot of the things that we're waiting on God for, right? Um, Jesus has been said, come, and you still waiting on God because your faith has not risen to the level of actually doing what you said you wanted to do, right? 
But Peter rose his faith to that level. He said, you know what? If it's you, I'm looking at you walk on water. I believe that I can do whatever you tell me that I can do. And if it's really you, God, since it's you, come on, just bring me out there with you. And so Peter gets out the boat. Now, we don't know if the other men are screaming at him. We don't know if they're saying, no, don't do it. Why would you do that? You're going to die, right? We don't know if that's what was happening or not. Could have very well been, right? Um, knowing the nature of people, and they might not even have been screaming it, right? Sometimes it's worse. Uh, because they don't scream it, right? Sometimes it would be better for you if they did scream it, but they don't scream it. They just sit around and they whisper, right? You hear people whispering, is he really going to go out there? Is he really going to do this? Is he really going to, he don't even know if that's Jesus. What if it ain't Jesus? What if it ain't, right? So sometimes people just, you know, whisper. Peter ignored whatever was going on in the boat, right? So we don't know what the other 11 men were doing. They might have just been sitting in shock like, right? We don't know. We don't know what they were doing. But whatever they were doing, Peter ignored all of them. And at this point, he was even ignoring the storm. The fact that there were winds and waves and thunder and lightning, all of that, he was still ignoring at the time. And he walked on water. Now, we can talk about for the longest. And most of the times, other than when my husband has preached it, I have heard people talk about the failure of Peter over and over and over and over again without highlighting the fact that he walked on water, whether it was one step or 10, he walked on water. He did what Jesus was doing, right? For however long he did it, he did it, which shows us that we have the power to do what Jesus is doing as long as we have the faith to do it, right? Please don't miss that point. Uh, before we start talking about how he got his eyes off the water. Just think about when his eyes was on Jesus, he did what Jesus was doing. When his eyes was on Jesus, he did what Jesus, when his eyes were on Jesus. If we could just take our focus off of our problems, off of our issues, off of our circumstances, off of our haters, off of all the things that cloud our judgment and make us think that we can't, right? If we could take, uh, look, take our mind off the people screaming in the boat, right? The people who don't want to get out and try. If we stop listening to those people and just keep our eyes on Jesus, we can walk on the water, guys. We can do it. We can walk on that water. Hi, Stacy. We can do it. Uh, um, yeah, I totally believe that. Lene said sometimes her auntie tells her uh, that it's about us taking that first step. And I totally believe that. Sometimes uh, we're waiting on God and God is like, I, what you waiting on me for? I'm waiting on you. Are you going to trust me? Are you going to believe me? Are you going to have the faith to actually move and do what I told you to do? So he's out there. He's, he's looking. His eyes are fixed on Jesus. He's walking on the water. I can imagine he's like, oh, my gosh, I'm doing it. And the men in the boat are probably like, oh, my God, he's walking on water. Uh, it's amazing, though. None of them got up and was like, me too, me too, right? We don't hear that story. It's told all these times in all the Gospels, but you don't hear about them getting up saying, me next, right? Um, they like, oh, look at Peter. He got that thing, right? And it's the people in your life that for as much as you do for God, they still don't want to walk and use their own faith. They just want to vicariously live through you and say, you do that, girl. Go ahead, boy, right? But they still don't want to use their own faith. So Jesus is walking, but then look, it says in verse uh, 30, um, this is what it says about Peter walking. It says, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And so he uh, was doing it. He, his eyes was on Jesus. He had it going on. He was doing it. But then he took his focus off Jesus and put it on the storm. 
And when he took his focus off Jesus and put on the storm, the Bible says he started sinking, right? Now, this, of course, is an obvious correlation, right? When we are walking in faith, we have to make sure that we keep our eyes on Jesus, that we don't keep our eyes on our problems or our issues or our struggles or our persecutions, that we're not thinking about all that could go wrong and all of these things. We can't doubt. Uh, while I was studying, I found uh, today uh, that doubt literally, literally is talking about being divided in two, right? Divided into the word uh, for doubt that's used here. Uh, when Jesus asked him, why did you doubt? Uh, the word is divided in two. And so to doubt really is, is to be divided between two things, right? Is this the way or is that the way? That's doubt. Whereas faith is single-mindedness. Um, it's oneness. It's I believe what God said, no matter what, there's no doubt. There's no other opinion other than this opinion that God has given me. And I single mindedly am believing God no matter what. Right. And so um, sometimes we think that um, uh, doubting uh, uh, means that we have like uh, don't believe God at all, right? Uh, but it's not that. It's that you believe you have faith, but you also um, are divided, right, in two. And so you have the faith, but you got some other little stuff. Well, maybe in what if and what, and you have to deal with your doubt to bring it back to oneness. Um, and most of the time for me, when I stop trying to explain it, uh huh. When I stop trying to figure it out, when I stop trying to make logical sense of a spiritual thing, then doubts will begin to dissipate, right? When I actually just say, you know what, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. I, I don't know. I, I really don't. But I know you're God, and I know you're a God that works miracles, and I know that you have promised to do it. So I ain't got to try to figure it out, right? Uh, the old saints used to say, why are you trying to figure it out? He done already worked it out, right? So why are you trying to figure it out, okay? And so we need to bring our, our double-mindedness uh, to a singularity, and that singularity is found in God's word. I just believe what it says. I, you know, people try to get you to explain it. And they want, they want you to tell why and how is this supposed to happen? And girl, where that's going to come from? And how you know? It was, I don't know, but I know God's word is true. And I'm singularly focused on the word of God. Now, you can talk about Peter because, he, you know, he fluctuated and he got divided and he started sinking. But he knew where to call. He said, Jesus, right? Now, some of us, when we start doubting and when we start seeking, we have so much pride, we won't even call on Jesus. We'll just keep on going down, 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 down. And then on top of that, we'll get mad because don't y'all see me thinking somebody do something, right? Um, and I'm, I would imagine the people in the boat like, man, did nobody tell you to go out there, right? Once you sink it like that, the only person that can save you is Jesus. You're too far away from the boat because you walked out in faith. You're too far away from the boat for your friends to help you, right? The only thing that's going to help you now is Jesus. You've got to call on Jesus when you see yourself going down. You can't be embarrassed. It ain't time for that. You about to drown, fool. You about to drown. It ain't time to be embarrassed. It ain't time to, to, to be proud. It's not time for none of that. It's time to say, Jesus, I messed up. Come get me. Get me out of this, right? Um, we have to learn how to do that. At least Peter knew the call, right? He wasn't calling Matthew. He wasn't calling his brother. He wasn't calling nobody in that boat. He said, Jesus, save me. And that's what we've got to do. Jesus, save me. Uh, in this version of the story, Matthew tells us that uh, uh, Jesus reached out and grabbed him immediately and caught him uh, before he drowned, right? And then said, oh, ye of little faith, right, uh, is what King James says, oh, ye of little faith, right? Now, he didn't say, oh, ye of no faith. So he did acknowledge this wasn't like a discredit 
to what you know Peter had done. He did acknowledge that Jesus, I mean, that Peter had some faith, right? Uh, but he called him. The Bible says it's almost like um, the word that they use uh, for little faith is like one word. So it's almost like he called him the name little faith. Oh, ye of little faith, right? So it wasn't like, oh, ye of little faith, right? You know, Jesus is like, man, little faith, what? What? You were doing it, right? It's almost like that, right? You were, look, you were doing it, right? Then once he got on back in the boat, he was like, why did you doubt? <laughs> why did you doubt, right? What made you doubt, right? And I, I think that that's important for us to ask ourselves that question. Like when we doubt, we need to ask ourselves, what made you doubt? So that the next time you won't doubt, right? Because you'll see that that was crazy to do, okay? So Jesus actually made him ask that question to himself. What made you doubt? Why did you doubt? Uh, and so then they got back into the boat. Uh, and uh, now all the men in the boat like, oh, Jesus. This, you are the son of God. And I, I bet Peter looking at him like, oh, but y'all couldn't get out there and walk with me, <laughs> right? Oh, now he the son of God, right? But now he ain't no ghost. Now y'all see who he is, but y'all didn't want to get out there and walk with me though, right? Right? So they're back in the boat. Um, and then they go to, uh, the Bible says, over to Genesara, and Jesus started doing exactly what he's been doing. He started healing the sick and delivering people. The Bible said uh, people were coming and just saying, please let us just touch the hem of your garden, your garment so we can get healed. And so Jesus just picked up where he left off. It wasn't no big deal to him. Like, oh, well, maybe next time you'll get it, right? All right, back to business. We're healing people. We're delivering people. We're having compassion. We're right back at it, right? I'm sure Peter like, what? We, we ain't going to take a break. <laughs> we just going to get off the boat and keep on going. We not. I need some rest, Jesus, after that. Nope. They went right back to doing the will of God, right? That's how we have to be in our lives as well. Uh, once we fall, once Jesus picks us up, ain't no rest time then. Oh, I got to rest. Nah, nah, keep busy. Get right back to doing what you knew you were supposed to be doing in the first place, right? Jesus has saved you now. He's He's lifted you up. He's picked you up, dusted you off, said, why did you doubt? Made you assess yourself. Now you know. Next time you know, get back to work, right? Get right back to work. All right, that was Matthew 14. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a very um, enjoyable chapter for me, especially since my husband just preached it on Sunday. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, it's a story we know very well because it's one of his favorite sermons to preach, and he always preaches it differently. So I was, of course, challenged to teach it differently. Um, um, so I hope you got something new out of it uh, for those who are lifers. Uh, that you hadn't heard before. But we will be on in the next video to uh, Matthew the 15th chapter. And until then, you be blessed and know that I love you and God loves you too. In Jesus' name, amen.